Hello everyone, welcome back to the True Footy podcast this time. it has. Uh, this is like our third or fourth podca- podcast this year. Uh, naturally, since I have left Perth, uh, Busher hasn't been around to do them with me. I've done one since, one since I've left Australia with Druzy, who uh, at the moment is in Manchester, but couldn't make it down for a podcast today. So today um, serves the purpose of being a bit of a like, reflection piece for this year, I suppose, even though we're not quite at the end of it yet. It is November. We're getting there, but uh, yeah, it was a bit of a reflection piece. So uh, as many of you would have seen, or some of you would have seen in the YouTube like community tab, I uh, put up a post asking for some questions for discussion in today's podcast. So I've got about 19 of those. Thank you very much. And we're going to cycle through those and talk about a variety of topics. Some of them are just about life generally. And um, uh, yeah, and then some, some are also about football as well. So we'll work through all of those. A little bit aggressively hungover today. Um, I went out to Manchester to sort of say goodbye to Jersey. Like I, I thought he, I wasn't going to see him again before he leaves Manchester, but uh, maybe I will. I'm not sure. I thought it was a goodbye, so I had a huge night, and um, yeah, decided that today would be the day I take on a long format podcast. The reason I'm looking outside right now is there's somebody on the balcony, and uh, if they look into my apartment right now, they will be see me sitting in front of a tripod talking this must be really weird anyway it's life of being a youtuber bro um so yeah we're going to cycle through some questions druzy is uh, heading back to australia soon i think so the time has flown between us sort of having a chat at the start of the year we did a podcast at the start of the footy season about how um well he had just moved to the uk and i was about to the time has flown past so yeah i guess it's a bit of a reflection piece on on the year that's been yeah it's been a big year very big year in all on all facets um so yeah thank you for your questions let's get into it okay now i'm making eye contact with this woman on her balcony i shit you not it is pissing it down outside and she is watering her plants i think she's just nosing at what i'm doing fair play too this this must look bizarre to her anyway so we'll get into true footy podcast 101 and uh we have the first question from luke mcmahon who asks what was it like leaving perth and how's the uk been so far thank you for your question luke what was it like leaving perth I left on April 10th in the end it was. I had my last day of work like March 31st or something like that. Got out of Bunnings just in time for Easter, which is a mad weekend. They were probably not really happy about that, but who cares? Uh, what was it like leaving Perth? You know, pretty emotionless. I like I wasn't having such a great time in Perth, like generally with my life. It wasn't so much Perth itself as a place. It was just like the circumstances of my life had um, gotten very stale monotonous and uh, i think i've covered that a lot on this channel not in depth it's not in depth but um yeah so by the time you know i left i i don't i didn't really feel any sense of sadness other than leaving my family so my dad and my sister live back in perth so leaving them was a bit heavy but i was always moving temporarily like i am going to go back to perth at some point so um, yeah, I, I didn't feel any sense of sadness, like too much, you know, I, I spent a month in America on the way to here. So there was kind of excitement on the other end of seeing my other sister who I don't get to see very often because she and I have lived in different cities since 2004. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was very difficult for me to leave and I haven't really missed it since. I miss obviously the people there, but I've been lucky enough to see my sister who came and visited in the UK, the the one that lives in Perth and, um, and her husband as well. And dad also met us in Canada for a little trip as well. So yeah, it hasn't been so long since I've seen them. And like, depending on how long you've watched this channel, you don't, I don't know how much you know about me, but I grew up overseas as well. And when I left, uh, high school to go to Perth as a uni student, I left my parents there in Abu Dhabi. So I have been away from my family so much that unfortunately I'm quite used to it. Um, that doesn't, that's not to say I don't miss them. Um, but yeah, other than that, like it kind of was a little sad leaving work, but at the same time, there's very much a sense of <sighs> Monday, the next week would have rolled around and they would have been just, it would have just been completely normal for everyone else. I don't think, uh, yeah, what am I trying to say here? The revolving door that is Bunnings of employees and managers and stuff, uh, the show would have gone on just fine without me. So once I realized that, you know, 
like sometimes I fantasize a little bit about like what it'd be cool. It would be cool to go back and surprise a few people. But I reckon after that, after the sugar hit of like surprising people, like friends and family, I reckon I'd be ready to go again. So um, yeah, the UK has been wonderful. Um, I have been a full-time YouTuber this, this entire time. I say full-time, I have spent a lot of that traveling as you probably know. Uh, so there has been weeks and months where I've sort of disappeared or I've tried to make it look like I haven't disappeared because I have been uploading content in advance to release while I'm away. So I tried my very, very best to pull that off this year. But since I've been back, I've been back six weeks now, I think since my last trip, that's the last one done. And I have, I've been a full-time YouTuber since then, um, quite often uploading twice in a day. I recently found out that I uploaded 50 videos in October. So yeah, been pretty obsessed with it. And uh, this has been the best month on the channel ever um, in just about every metric except subscribers. Because for some reason in oh no, 2021, I had a really big month. And for some reason in like March of 2019, my channel blew up, but I'm pretty sure it was because I made two cricket videos and those videos blew up. But anyway, weird, eh? Uh, but yeah, I love the UK at the moment um, and I'm probably gonna be here for another year, I'd say. So thanks, Luke. Um, we'll skip through. Rogue Riot, got a couple of questions from Rogue Riot, friend of the channel. What's the biggest lesson you've learned from doing YouTube full time? And when the live stream's gonna make a return. Miss talking mad chat and quoting Emperor Palpatine. Oh yeah, I love the Palpatine quotes. I still pull them out every now and then. I went out with Drizzy last night and there was a few Palpatine quotes. I don't know why it's so funny, it just is. But thanks, Rogi. Um, I do miss those chats as well. There's a couple of reasons I probably haven't done them um, here. Primarily the time difference. So football games are on at like 4 a.m. here, at least a lot of the Eagles ones. And that is a bit of a shitty time for me to get up and like do a live stream where I'm gonna be loud, let alone actually get up. Like I'm, when I get up to watch the Eagles, I probably don't feel like live streaming when I'm still half asleep. So that's one reason. Um, the other one is like, and this kind of ties into your other question, what are the biggest learnings from being a full-time YouTuber? Is that I've had to be a lot more intentional with what kind of videos I make because at the end of the day, like I'm almost thinking of it transactionally. I need to think what videos are gonna be worth the effort because I need to almost put like a dollar per hour mindset to it. So if I'm gonna spend half a day doing a certain project or like a video, and I need to make sure it's, a, it's going to get views. So, uh, the other, so the other aspect to that is live streams don't really make any money at all because I think you get paid per ad view, right? Um, on live streams, you get one ad view at the start and then it's done. So I know that's a really lame answer and I feel a bit guilty saying that because it just sounds like I'm here to try and make money. I hope that's not what people think, but uh, naturally like I am trying to pay the rent. I am trying to have enough money so that I can buy the nicer type of beef at the supermarket rather than the, the, the like shitty stuff that I buy <laughs> at the moment. Um, so it's, it's an effort thing. Uh, effort, it's a reward for effort thing. That's not to say that I won't do them, um, but that is one aspect of why it ha I haven't been prioritizing them as much. Um, yeah, because it's like three or four hours, or three hours work if you do a live stream, and I might make like $11 for it. So we'll see. Um, but in terms of that, yeah, like in terms of lessons, I think it's almost at times hamstrung me a little bit doing it full time. You'd think that you'd have more time to do stuff. You'd think that like I'd be on TikToks, making on TikToks, what am I, a boomer? I'm 30 soon, I turn 30 in 20 days. Um, you'd think I'd have more time for that sort of broader stuff, but it's the opposite. By contrast, I actually need to just focus on stuff that's going to get a return on investment, right? So you have gotta think of it like a business. I'm good. If I'm gonna put time into things, I need to be creating videos every day and I need to make sure that they're good ideas it's all about title and thumbnail a good concept of a video so you know before i could probably put more time in like when i started this channel i could put days and weeks into a particular video now i just don't have that time and therefore i find myself having to compromise a bit on the creative aspect of it so <clears throat> i don't have the time to put in effort over several days to make a really good video and you know do all the graphics and stuff like that I need to really be efficient with my time so I think I mean it's it's one thing to say it now because the channel's going well at the moment but that, like for the most part this year it really wasn't like the channel had probably dipped below 
like 2019, like way less views. Um, 2018 even. Arguably some of the worst views I've ever done. Um, like there was a time where my Just The Tips would get 5,000 to 10,000 views. That was like 2021 when we first sort of launched that as a show. And I know that the show has dropped off uh, because of a variety of reasons. Now I do it on Squiggle. Some people like the Squiggle, some people don't. But by contrast now, like I think I did a few that got like 800 views, just the tips this year. So um, this is a bit of a tangent. What was I saying? Anyway, I think I was just talking about like the different like formats and, and videos that I've had to lean into. And I think about halfway through the year, I just decided to focus on my strengths. I started focusing a little bit more on Eagles content because, um, well, it was easy to this year because they gave us a lot of headlines, didn't they? So there was that, but I just felt like at least I can do that well and not um, half ass videos that will get modest amount of views. People were started watching my Eagles videos more than anything else at one point. Um, and then the trade and draft stuff, that's natural to me. So leading into those strengths has served me well this year. So that's probably the lessons. I don't think I've grown as a creator, to be honest. I've probably regressed in some ways. But in the future, I would like to get back to the point where just the shit tip, just the shits, just the tips, is probably like a bit more of a cool production, ideally with like a co-host or something like that. That's that's the way I'd like to get back to. It's just not really possible right now. And my weekly reviews that I used to do did not get a lot of interest from the viewers. Um, and it was the most difficult and time consuming aspect of all, all the content that I did because you had to be across all nine games. And no one watches all nine games. So I, had, I had to really try hard to just put out a 20 minute video with a lot of effort and didn't see really much reward for that effort. So that's kind of a bit of insight as to what it's like being a full-time content creator. Yeah, it's it's not, being full-time hasn't really given me the advantages I'd hoped. Got a couple of shorter questions. Uh, first of all, from Max Hansen, he asked, any hobbies, uh, what do you do in your spare time? So uh, this isn't a shitty answer. I don't do a lot in my spare time. I don't have a lot of spare time. I get up at like, I get up at nine, which is not the earliest, but the reason I do that is because I, I pretty much edit to like 11 p.m. every night. And don't get me wrong, I, I take breaks for like, I eat and then I'll watch like something on YouTube um, and I'll relax for a little bit, but I'm still on my laptop and then I'll just get straight back into work and then I'll go to the gym in the middle of the day. So I'd say my hobby is the gym. I'm really, really into it, always have been. I may not look it, but I, <laughs> I do. And it got to the point where I was going twice a day at one point. Um, I just love the the routine of it, the discipline. I feel like crap when I don't go. I like having that trained feeling. It's hard to explain. Like if you, when you don't go to the gym for a little while, you, you, you feel a little bit soft, um, like internally as well. I don't know how to explain it other than that. So I just like feeling strong, even if I don't look good. Like I, it, it changes the way I feel about myself. Um, and then of course, you know, wanting to look good it's not just about getting girls or anything like that. It's, it's kind of your personal brand. So like, I'm sure I could look better if I train better, but I just, I do everything I can, at least in that sense. So I, I don't feel insecure about that aspect of me, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, go to the gym every day. If anyone's interested in what I do, it's, it's the most basic routine ever. I just do push, pull legs. So one day that's, uh, you know, chest and shoulders. The next day I do back. And then, then I do legs and then I repeat that cycle and I will literally try and go to the gym every day. And uh, as it happens, there's usually one day a week like today where I'm hungover, where um, I'm not hungover once a week. I just mean there'll be one day a week where I just can't go to the gym and then that week I'll still have gone six times. That is pretty much my only hobby. I don't really have the luxury of taking time to do other stuff. Um, what else do I do here though? I mean, yeah, I just kind of watch TV. Uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I'll, I'll chuck on Family Guy, which that's one thing that's actually intrigued me this year. I've realized like watching back Family Guy, how much Family Guy has influenced my personality and my jokes. Like I'm literally off camera. I'm like a combination of Peter Griffin and Stewie Griffin. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of Quagmire in there too. But it's interesting to see, like think about how much TV shows influence you. Family Guy's great. I won't, won't hear a single bad thing about it. I am Braz asks, just a simple question, but who's your favorite musical artist? Musical artist. Um, I don't know if I have an ultimate one, um, but I'll, I'll list some to give you some insight. This lady is still watering her plants. She's starting to piss me off. This is so weird. It's off-putting. I feel watched. 
which is ironic, I know. But it's weird trying to do this when somebody's looking at you going, what the hell is he doing? Anyway, I think they're wet, love. <laughs> anyway, um, Tame Impala, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, huge Robbie Williams guy. Love Robbie Williams. That's more of a nostalgia one, but I think the music is really good. Um, Travis Scott. So like when I go to the gym, I have like different types of music for like what I'm doing. So when I walk into town for my morning coffee, that's where I'll put on more like indie folk stuff. Um, you know, Bombay basketball club, like that, that, that's like my walking tunes. And then when I'm at the gym, I listen to house music or nineties R and B when I'm doing upper body. But when I do cardio or when I train legs, I go into a bit more of a grind mindset because I hate both. And I just try and get myself in the frame of somebody who's putting in the work that he doesn't really want to do. It sounds so silly. But I've listened to like rap mostly. Yeah. So like Travis Scott in particular. Uh, I realized I listened to a lot more Drake than I realized. Like if you'd asked me if I'd like Drake, I would have said not really. But I'm pretty sure on my Spotify, like what is it? The, um, the year in review, like I listened to Drake way more than anyone else, but uh, than anyone, any other artist. But I couldn't really tell you that, like which songs I really love. I don't know. It's weird. I think he just dominates a lot of my like rap and hip hop like playlists. So yeah, that kind of answered the question. I think anyone I'm missing. Oh, I love Confidence Man. That's a real girly pop kind of thing. From uh, it's like this brother sister group. Well, it's a duo kind of a quartet. Um, but yeah, Confidence Man slaps. I really do. Oh, I'm actually really into Fisher now. Never liked Fisher before. They're like I do like Tech House in general. I really hate that song, Losing It. But he's, he's released a couple of bangers this year, particularly like this summer or like English summer. And I'm like, yes, I like this guy. When I edit, the, I listen to this play, um, his set. I think it's Fisher at Out, Outside Lands. I'd recommend it. Big fan. Big fan of Fisher now. We will get into more... Um, footy topics later if anyone's bored of just me talking about myself amusement productions ask is the bunnings still functioning okay without my glorious king jesse in operation there i wouldn't know mate i wouldn't know i messaged my bosses like a few months ago and it seemed to be going all right it seems to be going all right if it wasn't going well they probably wouldn't admit to me anyway um but yeah bunnings was um was a great place to sort of not grow up but i feel like i evolved a lot as a person there because uh, probably through leadership opportunities more, more so. Like but when I first got there, I was like this 22 year old uni student just working on the register. But you kind of go through the evolution of like being, you know, everyone's mate to then being kind of a, like a supervisor, which is kind of like their boss and their mate at the same time. And by the end of it, I was a manager there and the leadership, I think skills that I got out of that, not just through, not just leadership, but also trying to be as good at Bunnings as I possibly could, even though it was just my uni job. I think that served me well. I think I'm one of those people, well, I, I like to just do whatever's in front of me as well as I can. I don't necessarily shoot for the stars, but if I'm doing something, um, I'd like to, to try hard. And I think that enabled me some opportunities to like move up within the business, be a boss to people that were friends. Like I think, the it really probably developed my communication skills probably some confidence stuff as well i can easily you know go into a new group of people um and hold conversations and drive the conversation even though i'm quite an introverted person i think you know i i would constantly be hiring people and then training them up and stuff like that so you've got to be the bigger person in a way you've got to be on the front foot and be a leader i suppose if that makes sense that wasn't totally over answering your question. It was a bit of a side tangent there, but I, I think I owe a lot of my personal development to Bunnings and I'm very, very fond of that place. So I do miss it. I was, it was a good time for me to get out and I think I extracted pretty much everything I could out of that place, um, but it was very worthwhile. Martin Reed asks, g'day Martin. Hey mate, hope it's going well over there, thank you. What's it like been have, uh, having YouTube as your main source of income now as a full-time content creator? Without getting into personal specifics, is it a steady steam stream of income? Steady steam. Can you kind of project your monthly income or is it a bit up and down? Is it a bit stressful in that sense? Well done on going through it, uh, going for it. Thank you. Um, if you work a job you love, if you don't work a day in your life. Yes, thank you, Martin. Appreciate you. 
I've seen Martin's name around for a few years now, I think. Um, now, I, I'm actually okay with being pretty open about what a YouTuber earns, at least what I earn. I don't really care uh, because it's not like I'm telling you my annual salary. It's just right now I'm a full-time content creator, but I will be getting a job soon. So like a little bit different to tell you my annual salary. So we'll start. Is it a steady stream of income? Uh, I said steam again. Stream of income. Somewhat, somewhat. I, I have gotten pretty good now at being able to roughly tell how much money I'm going to make per day based on the output that I do. And roughly like if it's a 5,000 view video in a day versus 2,000, I have a rough idea of how much it's going to be. On a good day, if I'm uploading two videos a day lately, it's been like 150 bucks a day. Um, if I'm doing that, I'm pretty happy and I work seven days a week. So I, well, I'll just tell you, I, this was by far the best ever month I've did. In October for 50 videos, I made four and a half thousand dollars. Okay. Um, that is going to be a one and done. Like uh, November is not going to be like that. Uh, September was not like that, but that was for about 270,000 views. Also my best ever month. Um, prior to this, like this year to give you perspective, I think I made like $800 in June. So that is far below what is required to live. That doesn't even pay my rent. So I've dipped into savings pretty hard this year. Since I got back from Greece and it was the finals and stuff like that, and I was looking at getting a job and stuff like that, I quickly realized, oh, so suddenly the channel's actually doing well for the first time this year. And so I've just put everything into it. And there is a sense of predictability now. I can tell how much money um, I'm going to make um, I can forecast it a little bit, but it is going to dip hard in November. So by the time December comes, I need a job. I need a job. Um, I don't think I would leave to go home to get a job because I'd be in the same boat. I'd still need a job, but I haven't really been trying yet. So that, that transition is going to start. Um, is it stressful? It, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Uh, I don't find like the process of being like a YouTuber stressful or something and I haven't drained all of my savings like I've I'm nearly 30 years old so um, I'm not quite on the paycheck to paycheck level yet so you know I saved a bit of money prior to this trip but I, I have hit a point where I don't want to blow any more savings because like half of it's gone <laughs> so yeah is it stressful it's getting stressful yeah uh, Papley says, how have you settled in at Pomland and how long is the stay there? Um, I've settled pretty well. It, it is starting to get dark. So what is it now? Look, give me a sec. It is 420. <laughs> uh, and it is the sun's about to set. So that's the weirdest aspect of this place is the daylight hours. And it's trippy as well in summer because the sun will go down to like 930. And I don't like either. Like I could easily sacrifice an hour in the summer of daylight to get an hour back in winter. Um, you'd think they do daylight savings. It actually went the other way. We just put our clocks back because the, the sun rises at like 8 a.m. as well. So that's actually bothering me more than the cold. It's like looking out there and you feel like you need to be winding down. Like I need to think, I, I should be thinking about dinner, but it's 4, 4.20. Like I, f I feel like I should be thinking about dinner, but I'm probably won't eat for another three hours. It's crazy, but I'm good. I'm happy here, mate. Yeah. How long am I going to be here? Probably this time next year, I'd say. I think I think this time next year is when I'll live. Just on that as well, it's kind of interesting, like when people leave and travel and they they find themselves or whatever. People think talk about like learning lessons and getting stuff out of being somewhere else. I don't think I've grown as a person. I think I've just restored myself a little bit to the person I used to be before I got like massively depressed in Perth. I think I've grown socially. I'd probably, my social skills, maybe not my social skills, but my ability to navigate through awkward situations with people is so, it's so strong right now. Like, because I've done several contikis. You go on a trip with 50 people you just met. Uh, I've done two of that, uh, that and I've did a, done a sale Croatia as well. You just get stuck with strangers. That in conjunction with probably my experience at Bunnings means that like I can just walk into a group of strangers now and just confidently start chatting. Like when I go out with Will, he's a local, he doesn't naturally feel like he's on holiday. Like I feel like usually it's me chatting to strangers and, and it'll be some dumb like conversation starter. When I went on 
I went to a pub crawl in Athens. This was like one of the last days of my last holiday. We went, I went on a pub crawl with this, um, this friend I'd made, this Kiwi girl. And yeah, went on a pub crawl, which is the same concept. I've done so many of those now as well, where you just go to a bar by yourself, meet a group of like 30 people and you go out drinking together and everyone's like mostly there by themselves. And she was quite nervous for it. And I was just like, I, I, and I wasn't. And uh, she just sort of noted that like, I went there and just started talking to absolutely everyone. <laughs> like almost like I was so experienced, like I was almost trying to get people to start talking to each other. Um, and that is really out of character for me. That is not, I'm, I'm usually just sort of chill in the corner kind of guy. So that's one thing I've probably gotten out of traveling, I suppose. Um, but that might ebb and flow. Like it might go away again. It's probably a skill that you gotta, it's like a muscle you gotta keep working. Chuck538 asks, Hey mate, have you uh, have watched your content on and off for a few years and was drawn to the fact that you were a footy loving law student? Shout out Chuck. As someone who is finishing my law degree now but isn't fully on board the idea of practicing and the prospect of working in the corporate grind, what are your reflections on finishing uni and do you have any regrets about not getting admitted? Thanks for the question, Chuck. Yeah, so do I have any regrets? No, I think I realized like pretty early in my law degree I didn't wanna be a lawyer. In fact, the only reason I got into law or went to do law is it was the best thing that I got into. And the good thing about a law degree is that it's pretty versatile. The skills that you get from it um, are pretty transferable. And a lot of people I know that practice law, sorry, studied law, didn't practice law, like they went into business. So from that point of view, mate, like it's a pretty versatile degree. So if you're not sure about actually working as a lawyer, you've got options. Um, I don't have any regrets about that, no. As for me, like around the time, like late into my degrees when I kind of discovered YouTube and, and became a passion and I became obsessive about this, um, I, yeah, I kind of graduated an awkward time for that. So instead of going to get a grad job, I stayed at Bunnings where I love, I worked with my best mates. I was on reasonable money for what the work was and it allowed me the flexibility to still make YouTube videos on the side with a rotating roster, some weekends on, some weekends off, like it just worked. It was close to my house, there was no commute really. So I kind of just fell into the cycle of Bunnings YouTube, Bunnings YouTube. Um, now I am probably going to be looking for more corporate jobs. I wanna work in marketing, because I, I also studied marketing. And I'm finding that tricky now as a nearly 30 year old with no experience. So I'm gonna have to eat shit for a little bit. I might get a, car, a terrible job, <laughs> who knows, but I need something on my resume. But um, yeah, as for you, mate, like I would probably just contemplate, do you have any hobbies that you could potentially either commodify or turn into a business? Does that interest you at all? I'd probably just be introspective about that and, and have a crack because if you're just finishing a degree, I'm gonna presume you're probably younger than me. I graduated at 25. You've got time, you've got time. So. Uh, I don't know. I also, one thing I noticed about law was that I just wasn't like the other people studying law. So I studied law and commerce at the same time. And it was very, very interesting the different personalities you would get from one um, faculty discipline to the other degree is what I'm trying to say. Like you go, <laughs> you go to a commerce class and you'd, I'm not necessarily like that academic, but like you would go in there and you could weed out like 20% of the people that just didn't want to be there and they were just fucking around and not going to class. And then there'll be a few high achievers, but generally like I was probably like upper middle, I don't know, on average, not, not always, definitely not always. But in law, I just constantly felt like the dumbest person in the room. Um, and I often was just because everyone there was very, very into like the, the, um, law itself, politics, super academic, super ambitious. And I just always felt like a little bit of a black sheep there. And it's probably telling that I don't have any friends from law other than Busher. But as you, if you know who Busher is, like he's not the most stereotypical law student either. <laughs> so uh, we've, we've sort of bonded over that. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably my reflection on, on finishing my degree. I'm grateful I have the degree. I am going to use it, ideally. Well, actually ideally I, I, I make a career out of YouTube, but um, yeah, no regrets, no regrets. But it's a versatile degree, mate, so you should be fine. Should probably start moving through these a little faster. 
Uh, Tom says, have you ever thought about returning to Australia, but in a new state? Uh, yeah, yeah. If I do go anywhere else, it'll be Melbourne. I am contemplating that at the moment, um, but it's at least another year away, but I am coming back to Australia and I will end up back in Perth because I'm still, I'm still paying for my Eagles membership. I'm not giving that up. It just might not be, you know, the, I might go Melbourne next. Who knows? Diz YouTube asks, we're starting to get into the footy questions now. Would you prefer McKercher and Curtin or Reed and pick 19? I personally think this is the deal that'll get done. Two and three, four, one and 19. Also, how do you plan to watch the AFL since you're traveling now? Do you stay up to like 3 a.m.? Hope the UK is going well. Thanks, mate. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, so I've been traveling like obviously this whole year. And when I'm like in different countries, I can't watch Eagles games. But, you know, I, I have um, like watched... Uh, no, I watch KO through a VPN um, and I get up early for the games, particularly the Eagles games. And for finals, I got up early as well. Obviously, the grand final didn't miss that. Uh, so it is a little tricky, but I, I, I get it done. It, it doesn't phase me, particularly because I like this is my job. So it's not a big deal. As for that trade, yes, I would take McKercher and Curtin for Reed and 19. I would do that. I think that's a great deal for us, to be honest. I don't think it will happen, though. I don't think North are going to be willing to give up two and three, even with one and 19 coming back. So yeah, I don't, I don't see it happening, but I would, I, McKercher and Curtin, I think would be better for us longer term. Shaz Tech says, I'm always interested in hearing about future father-son prospects. This, I mean, this could be a, like a video I do in the future, but um, what I can tell you is, you know, you got a few this year. Uh, we got Jordan Croft and Will McKay probably go in the top 20. Um, I think that's all other ones I can think of. And, but next year there's gonna be a heap. So you've got Lucas and Ben Camperioli, um, for Carlton next year. You've got Tyler Welsh, son of Scott Welsh, uh, for the Adelaide Crows, key forward. He'll go top uh, top 10 maybe at this point. Levi Ashcroft, another top three pick they reckon next year. And Louis Montgomery. So all those players, I think it's Brent Montgomery's son. All those players used to, uh, sorry, are, are 2024 eligible next year's draft. And there's a heap of academy players too. But again, that's probably a topic for another day in terms of more detail than that. But, but those are the ones coming up. Um, Tyler Welsh, key forward. Levi Ashcroft, midfielder. I think the Camprioli brothers are both midfielders. Um, and Louis Montgomery, I actually don't know. I don't know. It's crazy that all of these players played when I was a kid, like their fathers. That is sobering. Rogue Riot has another question. Looking at the draft, what would be the best case scenario for two players that the Pies could draft at their two picks? So I think with the position Collingwood's are at, are at they can afford to go long-term with these selections and probably just go best available. Do they need a young ruck? Possibly. So if there's a Green or Mitch Edwards available at their picks, I think they're good value on talent. They could probably look at a key forward um, like project tool as well, and that's Archer Reed. So Archer Reed's probably gonna go in the 20s or 30s. There's not too many key forwards in this draft, so he's one of the best available. Um, uh, other than like Caddy and uh, Jed Walter, of course, but there's a big gap to the next one. Reed's a bit more of a prospect or like speculative one because he's like tall and athletic, but needs to put it together. But I think Collingwood are one of the best placed teams to take a punt on a key forward and he's going to be around that range. But you could get some sliding talents like Lance Collard. There's a little bit of um, conjecture about where he's going to go in the draft because uh, not so much talent, but if he potentially isn't super keen on leaving WA, you know, that might mess with his ranking. So Collard could slide, Falstrup could slide potentially. He probably won't. I'm more hearing now he goes late first round. Charlie Edwards is a player that is going to be around that range, and I really like him as a midfielder. Then at their second pick, there's some really good... Um, like if they could just go best available, I actually wrote down four defenders. Two Giath, Angus Hasty, Nathan Philaktides, and Luaman Lawal. All those players are probably going to be available around those picks, and I think would be... Good players that could probably play early. They all have a bit of running carry. They all got a bit of craft. Um, but I think Collingwood is really well placed to pick probably a, pro a project player or just go best available, particularly when, you, when you're looking around that part of the draft. Um, I don't think Collingwood need to have too much of a sp more specific strategy than that. But let me know your thoughts in the comments. Tom Macker, talk us through your favorite West Coast players through each generation of the team. Absolute standout favorites, but also some you've had a soft spot for. This is a good one. So when I started watching football, it was 2002, probably more 03 when I fully got locked in. Um, Cuz was the poster boy of the club. My grandparents had Benny Cousins posters around the house. Um, 
Brian Cousins was one of my dad's favorite players. So he was originally my favorite player. Then this kid called Chris Judd started tearing the league a new one. <clears throat> and I remember going to get my first Eagles jumper from probably the AFL store. I don't really remember. And I, dad said I can get a number ironed onto the back. And he, I remember he expected me to get nine, but I asked for three for Chris Judd. So I had a good eye for talent, clearly. <laughs> I was like nine. Um, yeah, I was nine in 2003. Uh, so yeah, I've pick, picked him as my favorite player. Daniel Kerr, though, retrospectively, is probably my favorite of the three. I just think he is such an underrated player. Like He gets talked about as being part of that amazing midfield, but I don't think outside of West Coast fans, people realize that he probably could have been the best midfielder in the game. Um, at various points throughout his career. He's not quite on Judd's level, but I think he's up there with Cuz. After that, when the club fell apart, my, my love for Luke Shuey really shone through. When we drafted him, he was kind of like the shining light. And I know that Nui was there as well, but because he was a bit more speculative, I think Luke Shuey was the one I lo- locked in on. So Shuey, Nat Nui, Andrew Gaff, I really liked as well. Then there was that little period where we had the spoon and a lot of those players were already drafted. I remember really liking Andrew Strike for a little while there, which is a really random one because he was just like a waffle mature age player that we got in. And I thought he had really good attributes. Um, yeah, I think, I still think it was a bit weird we delisted him. Murray Newman was another one I really liked. Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> he made a horrible mistake. Made a horrible mistake. Punched a bloke, went to jail for a year. But on talent, like I liked watching him play a lot. I really didn't want us to trade for Sherrod Wellingham. And then as soon as we got him, he became one of my favorite Eagles as well. I thought he was cool as hell. Um, And was a really good player there for a few years and then sort of obviously got phased out. In the newer generation, Rioli um, was. uh, Obviously now he's, I don't hate him, but I don't really care about him anymore because he's not an Eagle. But he was probably my second favorite player there for a bit uh, behind Shuey. Oscar Allen, how could you not love him? You know, we all want him to marry our daughters. Probably not mine, because that's like, she's not even born yet, so he'll be an old man. But he'll have money, maybe, maybe, if he can stay single for long enough. Um, where am I going? Oscar Allen. Oscar Allen's probably my current eagle, favorite eagle, now that Shuey's sailed off into the sunset. Um, and Elijah Hewitt of the new breed is probably probably my favorite as well. Shaztek. Would like to hear your thoughts on if the Waffle Eagles should leave the Waffle and join the VFL. That is extreme. Honestly, what, what I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a national reserves competition coming anyway. So it doesn't make sense for us to play reserves in Victoria and travel there. I mean, I suppose the AFL team does it already, but I don't think we would need to burden ourselves to go play in the VFL. For a start, we just need to get our waffle team competitive in the waffle. And I do think it's injuries that have made it uncompetitive. But if we're coming so dead last in the in the waffle, if we go to a stronger competition, it's only going to get worse. So uh, no, but I think a national reserve comp is only a few years away, to be honest. And this is one of the last questions. Sam Reed says, do you feel West Coast are trying to build a gentleman's club? As in the guys they recruit slash bring in are genuinely nice people. Elijah, Ruben, Noah are all nice, polite guys. But you also have the likes of Oscar and Duggan, who seem to be the some of the friendliest players in the game. Interesting point. Um, I thought this this critic well not criticism, but this observation might have been more true, particularly around that 2013 to 2017 sort of draft era. So Duggan is a classic one of like private school boy, seems like the nicest guy in the world, um, just well groomed. Um, Oscar Allen's another one. Uh, so you make a good point there. I don't think it's a Dom Sheed probably as well. Nice fella. I don't think it's necessarily true anymore. Elijah Hewitt seems like a really likable guy, and I do like him. I really do. But um, I kind of hate saying this on a podcast, but I think he's a bit more... Let's just say I think he's a bit more of a bad boy than you realize. Uh, Ruben Jinby, another one. He is another nice kid. You can tell he's just a sweetheart. But one thing that he does have is he's just a contested... like competitive beast so I think that's more what it's about like the thing about Dugowie it's not necessarily as an example or Dusty it's not necessarily that they're just bad boys but they are it's it's about how competitive they are and I believe you can be unbelievably competitive and still be a good boy <laughs> Oscar Allen a good example of that Ruben Jinby great example of that um, Noah Long is just lovable he's such such a such a nice sweet kid um, I, I don't know him but I think we all know like if you watch the 
every game and watch all the press conferences and what people say about Noah Long, for instance. Um, yeah, I think that's correct. But I think he was probably just drafted on talent. So I, I don't think it's something we go for. But uh, broadly speaking, speaking, I think we probably do pay a lot of attention to image of a player, considering, you know, particularly that post-Cousins era. Um, we really tried to... We had a really bad reputation, obviously, for culture and stuff like that. So I think we tried to, like, sanitize our image a little bit. That being said, you know, with the, with the drafting we did, we won a premiership in 2018. So it's kind of vindicated anyway. The drafting on talent has been there. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily a type, I think. But we do like, obviously, players that interview well, which is kind of true of everyone. And Dan Curtin might be another one that we like because he's interviewed well. But it might be just because more of he, he's just a driven player who wants to get the most out of himself. So I think that's really what it comes down to. There's a couple of last questions here, but I might actually leave these ones for another video, guys. Um, Damien Tate says, hope you're enjoying Europe, man. Thank you. I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think each team's goal heading into 2024 is. So this will be a 20 minute video, um, but it's a good idea. So if you're interested in me doing like maybe like a pass mark or something like that for each club, that would be good. Global Footy also asks every team's best and fairest top three predictions for 2024. Another good idea. Another one that will require an entire other video. So I appreciate the input and I wanted to shout you out for commenting, but uh, I, I can't possibly answer that right now. Sweet. All right. That probably, that wraps up all the questions. Um, yeah, it's good to touch base with you guys. Uh, it's nice as well. Um, like, I don't want it to be like a vanity thing doing like a, an hour long podcast talking about myself. Um, it's kind of felt awkward at times, to be honest. But at the same time, I do kind of like having a bit more of a authentic relationship with you guys because like a lot of my videos are just analytical pieces, right? So um, having a, a dash of personality and interaction with you guys is, is, is important for the channel, I think. Um, so I appreciate all support. It's been great. Uh, I feel like my, between myself and, and the viewers, there seems to be really good synergy at the moment. Um, and usually what I mean by that is like, <laughs> one metric is like, if people disagree with a video or like a, a ranking in my videos and I say something dumb or make a mistake, generally how that's received is kind of how I feel like our relationship is. So for instance, if you're all slaughtering me and saying I was a piece of shit, <laughs> which has been true at times, um, you know, in the past, that's where I would say, huh, this isn't going so well. But generally, like if people are respectful and say, I disagree with you, but, um, or like you're completely way off base here, mate, but um, you know, this is what I would do, but I, I think the rest of it was good or something like that. I don't need necessarily people kiss my ass, but I, I hope you know what I mean by that because we're all gonna disagree about various stuff. And um, I, I feel like I've been politely slaughtered at times, which is all I can ask. That's good, keep it coming. So, uh, but yeah, appreciate the support and um, I really do. You guys are, you guys are great. I, I sometimes when I'm bored, I go back and watch like old Druzy yarns, uh, well podcasts I've done with Druzy. And there's looking back at one, well, there's a couple from like 2022, 2021, where I look at myself in that video and I just think, I can see the depression oozing out of you. Like I can tell that guy, he, I didn't want to be there. Like in that podcast, I didn't want to be there with Druzy answering questions on camera. I did want to hang out with Druzy. But the comments were always really good and um, I've always felt the love from you guys and I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. I'll probably end it there. Um, if you enjoyed this sort of format, maybe we can do something again, probably closer to the draft, we'll do a draft one. Um, doesn't have to be a personal one, probably probably good for a bit, but um, thank you very much guys and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.